Good morning. Hi, Karen. Good to see you this morning. It is a fabulous Friday. And God started showing me that there were certain days of the week that I dreaded for various reasons. Uh, he gave me words to speak over my days. Um, so it's Magnificent Monday, Terrific Tuesday, Wonderful Wednesday, Thankful Thursday, Fabulous Friday, Super Saturday, and Sweet, Sweet Sunday. Good morning, Lynn. How are you this morning? And my friend Judy, my new sister from Arizona. Hi, Debbie. And Barbara from Colorado's on. The beloved grandma of my sweet Tia my newest niece who married my nephew. Got a double blessing, got Tia as my niece and I got Barbara as my new spiritual sister. <laughs> Jana, hi Jana. So I guess I might as well get started. <clears throat> um, November the 20th of 2020, we're reading Ezekiel chapters 40 and 41. So, um, it's interesting what God's doing, and I'm sitting here allowing the Holy Spirit to guide my words. The other day, in the midst of something that God was doing, the anointing has been so powerful. Um, you, do, you guys do understand that the anointing doesn't come and go. If you are anointed of God, you're anointed. But it's just like our faith. He's, he's pre-measured how much faith he gave us. God gave us the, the amount of faith, the Bible says, my paraphrasing, that he wants us to have. So it's not a lack of faith. It's sometimes that we don't know how to activate that faith. We haven't exercised that faith. It's, it's, you know, faith is like our muscles. The more we use it, the stronger it gets. Same thing with the anointing. The more we use it, the stronger it gets. But the anointing recently has been out of this world, which it would be because it's from our Father. <laughs> um, and I, I love it. I'm getting I'm getting prayer, prayer, uh, praise reports from at the table, from other places that God is just. We we seem to have an openness, uh, perhaps as the temptation to become weary. Look at that hair. Good Lord. Leave that right alone. on live TV. <laughs> live TV, listen to me, I'm dating myself. That as the temptation for the weariness tries to set into us, and as we press in and we press in, of course the anointing. Of course the anointing. See, Debbie just typed on here, um, uh, uh, my friend over here that I can't think of her name, <laughs> Donna. <laughs> Debbie just put on here, God is into the details. That's why he doesn't want my part crooked while I'm on. on that's all right. It's going to stay crooked. <laughs> we have to have fun. <laughs> okay. So as we press in and that anointing gets stronger and stronger, our faith gets stronger and stronger, our revelation gets more and more powerful. It was in the middle of one of those times this week when I was sharing what God was saying to me, and, and then the reading in Ezekiel turned to, once again, God was speaking through Ezekiel all of the uh, dimensions of the temple to be built in, in, in exact detail. Well, here we are again today, details exactly about the, the temple. Uh, Ezekiel 40, verse um, 37 is an example. The gateway passage measured 87 and a half feet long and 43 and three quarters foot wide. Its entry room faced into the outer courtyard and it had palm tree decorations on the columns. There were eight steps leading to its entrance. So that's the type of reading we have today. And I want, I want to speak to those that maybe for the first time ever are reading these words. And I want to encourage you to read the words, to let it be a physical thing that happens, that you're reading historical text, 
that this was indeed the measurements. That is exactly how many steps led to the entrance, eight of them. That that's a fact. It's historical. And, and, and don't give up. When, when you're reading and it's boring to you and you're not sure why it's in there and you're not getting it, I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just asking you to please never, ever, ever give up. If anybody would have told me I would read the scriptures that I'm reading today and God would speak to me like he spoke to me today, if, if they had told me that 10 years ago, I, I don't know that I would have believed them, quite frankly. I don't, know, I don't think my faith had been exercised that much back then. I know the promise is, the promise that is written that his word will never return void, will never return void. So with that, I'm going to kind of dig in. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to dig in and kind of just share with you and stretch you a little bit. When I say that, there's also something else that I know about my father having read as many years as I have, which isn't as many as some of you have read. It's a little bit more than some of the others of you. But he's no respecter of persons. And he has one spirit. He is one God, only one God. There is not two, three, four, five, six, seven gods out there. There is one true God who manifests himself in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to us. There's one heart. My Father has one heart. One heart. And we're going to get to see his heart today. I, I got to see his heart today uh, in the way that he spoke to me as I read these. And so I just want to encourage you that it may stretch you. But then again, I want to encourage you that you may be going, oh, she's just now getting this. I got this, I got this years ago. I, God showed this to me in these read, because I know that I know that I know I am not the only one that gets it this way. I, why do I know that? Because I know my father. There was a time when I would get something brand spanking new, and I think, oh my gosh, I've never, I've never thought of that. I never had that revelation before. And all I did is get in my car and drive down the road and a teacher came on and they taught on the exact same thing I had. And I just thought, oh, it was the most novel thing I'd ever heard. And that there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. Okay, enough, enough of that. So in Ezekiel today, chapter 40 and 41, the other day in the middle of a strong um, Bible study, I looked right into the camera and told you guys that as I'm reading these descriptions, these dimensions of the temple, that I knew that God that morning had told me that it was my heart. And I let it go at that because I didn't, I got a little bit more than that that I didn't share the other morning. But I'm telling you, I got more today. Um... All of the dimensions, I mean, I just kind of think about it. So God is speaking through Ezekiel, who has to speak to other people. And I know they wrote it down because we're reading it today, um, that the steps was to be eight. There were to be eight steps, that the gateway passage was to measure 87 and a half feet long and 43 and three quarters feet wide and and it goes on and on and on into the details um and so i i stepped back for a moment and thought how freely i could just see you know god dictating a uh, dict dictation dictating to ezekiel and then e ezekiel dictating to the workers or to a scribe because he did dictate it to a scribe he wrote down some of it and how freely that flowed. God didn't have to stop and say, hey, wait, just a minute. let me measure this. Let me, oh, wait, let me see if this is going to fit before I say this, Ezekiel. God didn't have to do that. It flowed from him because God is God, right? Ezekiel didn't have to say, well, wait a minute, God. Wait, well, let me, let me check this for you. Make sure this is going to work. <clears throat> 
And knowing that he's talking about, now, uh, now I'm going to make it personal, uh, Elizabeth. This is, this is Elizabeth this morning that God says, this is your heart. And what I was able to see is, <sighs> my, I so desire to know him. I so desire to know that he knows me. He knows my heart so intimately that he can tell you how thick the walls of my heart is. He can tell you how the dimensions of the left chamber of my heart. He can give you the dimensions and tell you what kind of material my valve in my heart's made of. He can name every little vessel and aorta and those things things I don't even know that exist because I don't know much about the heart. He, he, he can just sit here. He could sit here with a heart surgeon and he could just talk about this, that, that, just as though he was talking about how to make bacon and eggs in the morning. <laughs> and it just put me in awe. It put me in awe. Now there's deeper spiritual things here and I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. But I want you now, we made it personal about me, that God knows my heart. Here's the deal. Let me talk about the steps for a minute. The first step in this, folks, is to read the historical text that's on, on, on your lap this morning or on the table in front of you. Read it. Read the historical. Let it be historical. Let it go, oh my gosh, do I have to know what color the tassels are on the curtain? Do I need to know what thread they use? Do I need to know... Yes, yes. Do we need to know the begats and the begots? Who was a descendant of who? Yes. Just read it. Just get on that treadmill and walk. Get on the treadmill. Just do it. And then, and then reach that stage if you need to, that you research and you look things up. I will tell you that I've uh, sidestepped that step an awful lot. I would use every excuse in the world that I'm too busy. I work too many hours. I talk to too many people in a day. I get on my phone in the mornings. I on and on. I haven't done a whole lot of research. I, I have a commentary on my computer. I've got commentaries in this house. Let me tell you what the commentaries will do for you. And when you're ready to take that step, I want to encourage you to take that step. Because those commentaries write down, those, those, those commentaries have it written, the revelations that so many people have gotten as they've read. And so when we read that somebody, somebody out there somewhere saw the description of the temple as a description of God's heart, that somebody out there saw the description of the temple as a description of their own heart, and you read that in a commentary, that, that, that when they picked up, I'm trying to think of something, the silver platter, that the silver platter meant something. Okay, let's get into today's reading. That when, when they read that its entry room faced the outer courtyard and it had palm tree decorations. Do you know that that is symbolic of something? Do you understand that? And if you look in the commentaries, they'll tell you what the palm trees represented. Then what happens is it breaks us out of our little box, our own little world of me, this, this little square that I've got myself in that does not allow my brain to go other places with the, with the scripts. And then he'll take you to a time, I believe. My father will take us to a time when he says, stop listening to anybody else. I want to speak directly through you, to you, through these words. I don't want it to be a commentary from this one, that one, or another. I want it to be me and you. And so this morning as I was reading and it was, it was, it was my father, my father, daddy, my father, and I, and I got to this part in verse 38, a door led from the entry room of one of the inner gateways, and I know he's walking from chamber to chamber inside of my heart. 
as I'm reading this, into a side room. And I was immediately reminded of the years at our Dream Big retreats when we would give all the girls a little key and tell them that we had things hidden in our hearts in the little chambers in our hearts and that God held the key that if we would allow him to come in and open the door and unlock it, the things that hurt us are hiding in there and we can bring it to the light and be healed. <clears throat> a door led from the entry room of one of the inner gateways into a side room where the meat for sacrifices was washed. On each side of the entry room were two tables where the sacrificial animals were slaughtered for the burnt offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings. And immediately God quickened my spirit today to tell me that that slaughtered animal, the blood shed, represents every sacrifice that I'm willing to make for my, for the sake of my father, for the sake of my faith, for the sake of my intimacy with him. It's a, see, it, it's an animal inside of my heart is being slaughtered today in that I'm being transparent with you guys that somebody out there may be saying, what is she talking about? This woman is, what? See, I sacrifice my reputation for the sake of getting on a Facebook Live and somebody saying, who does she think she is? What makes her qualified? That's a sacrifice. It's, oh, he showed me this morning that the slaughtered represents everything I sacrifice for the sake of God in my life. Everything that I'm willing to sacrifice. When I make it not about the cost. I no longer count the cost. When I make out a $1,000 check to somebody that's not necessarily worthy for that check, that hasn't earned that check, that it's no longer, it's not even my tithe. I make out a $1,000 check because I hear my father whisper and say, I want you to give. In that moment, those sacrifices represent and, and he made it about shedding blood because shedding blood, taking a life, taking a life. I don't even know how to put into words what I'm feeling. The sacrificial. I mean, I had a, a pet dog. I've had more than one. I've had pets who were dogs that were family members to me that when they passed away, I grieved for two weeks or more. More, really. I I wrote a poem. I, I have only written a handful of poems in my life. I wrote a poem about my puppy. She wasn't a puppy, she was full grown. It's like to sacrifice, do you know, I've gotten attached to a baby cow before, baby cow. I call them baby cows, they're calves. I was raised on a farm, I know the difference. I've gotten attached to one before we bottle fed uh, baby cows. <laughs> I've gotten attached to a baby pig before. So the taking of a life is sacred. Why is it called sacrifice? Because it's sacred. What does sacrifice represent? Sacrifice represents that we are giving up something. The sacrifice, so here we are, we're inside of my heart and we're going from the inner gateway into the side room. And then on each side of the entry room, we can see the two tables where the sacrificial animals are slaughtered for the burn offerings, for the sin offerings, and the guilt offerings. It represents every time I die to myself for the glory of God. That's what it represents. I die to myself. It's not about me, Lord. Father, did you hear what my husband said? Did you hear the tone of voice he used? Did you hear what he said? And my father says, be still. Be still. 
Do not defend yourself. Do not say a word. Do not, and I submit. Or my husband says, you know what? We've been saving for this. We've been trying to do this. We, we're, we're working together on this. And you've just asked if we can deviate from that a little bit, Elizabeth, and, and, and buy this. I don't think that's a good idea in that moment. I can rise up and I can defend myself and I can say, by golly, I work hard for my money. I work hard for our money, just like you work hard and I wanna buy that. But when I submit, when I submit, see those two little tables that's by the entryway of that room in my heart, what entryway are we talking about? We're talking about the entryway into the most holy place. Oh, guys. A whole new dimension opened up to me this morning. A whole new dimension. And then I look at my notes in my columns from the years prior. I remember going through the stage where he started showing me that the, the very first step for Elizabeth was the outer courtyard represented the denominations that preach salvation to get people to understand the sacrifice that Jesus made by giving up his own blood, by dying on the cross for us so that the whole world could be saved, so that all have salvation that choose by faith to accept it. The outer courtyard and then moving into the inner room where these two tables set. And then the holy of holies where we are transformed and the twinkling of an eye were made new. Ah, oh, I remember and I see it. And I've got it, I've got everywhere I go in different colors, I've got the inner courtyard in in purple. I, I've got the word on the on the side of it, the holy place, the most holy place is on and I I see the build up of year after year, the sacrifice of taking my time and reading. I made the sacrifice. There was years that Tom and I would get up at 4.30 in the morning to have enough time to read these scriptures before work. And I see the fruit of those sacrifices that was made inside of our heart when we chose to submit, when we chose to die to self. I gave up my right for an extra 30 minutes of sleep. I just, I, and you know what? I know about this. As excited as I am about what I'm getting this year, this is what I know. The best is yet to come. So if you're brand spanking new reading your Bible, this is what you have to look forward to. It may never be what I just spoke to you. It'll be what you need in your life at the very moment you need it. God will reveal. It's as unique as our thumbprints are. It's, it's unique. Our relationship with him is, is as individual as the tone of my voice that not other an, another out of 7 billion people on this earth has my tone of voice has has the patterns in my pupils of my that's how unique our relationship is with the father and i got to move to james and i'm not missing another james i don't think unless the holy spirit tells me to but james chapter <laughs> 4 verses 1 through 17 um, what is, and it just flows, it just flows from the Old Testament reading today into James, into Psalms. It just, it flows. It's like I'm going from one room, I'm going from the side room to the other room to the next. It just flows. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war with you, within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill. You scheme and you kill. You sacrifice to get it. <laughs> you sacrifice to get it. <clears throat> so this is also a picture of the opposite of what I was talking about happens in my heart when, when I choose to not count the cost of obeying my father. When I sacrifice anything I think I have a right to for the glory of God 
So what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Well, did you not hear how my husband talked to me, the tone of voice and, and what he said? And I see, I use those examples because my husband never raises his voice to me in 20 years. He never raises his voice to me. I can use that, that it's a safe example for me. It's not the same for everybody. But there's times that Tom says something that I have to go, oh, oh, am I gonna come back at that? Am, am I gonna let that slide? Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I'll do what my father says do. There are times my father says, have this discussion. There's times my father says, more times than not, be still. Be still, shut it. Be still, Elizabeth. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. See, we don't want to make those sacrifices. Do you see how it flows from the Old Testament reading into the New? We don't want to make those sacrifices. I don't want to get on that treadmill every day. I don't, I, I've still never spent, if you guys have heard me before, when he, when he was telling me to read the word and I was saying, why do I have to read this part? God said, well, it's just like that brand new set, uh, treadmill you bought in there. If you would get on that treadmill and stay and, and be faithful for one year, you won't even look the same. I've still never done that. Not, I have still to this day not spent one year of continuous exercise. And I don't mean continuous and it has to be every minute of every day. Three times a week. If I just do it three times a week, I, I my body would be transformed. I haven't done it. I still haven't done it. But yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and you wage war to take it away from them. I'm telling you right here today as you're reading this, God's speaking to you about the areas where you're manipulating situations in your life to get what you want. When all we have to do is, is say, you don't yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. God, did you hear how he spoke to me? God, I'm asking you, will you do a work in my husband's heart? Will you please, Father, will you speak to my husband about the way he spoke to me? Oh, but Lord, first before that, if there's something in me, did he speak to me that way because there's something in me? Lord, search my heart. Search my heart, O oh Lord, and show me if there be any wicked way in me and lead me on the path to righteousness. See, if we, if we take up those things out there that we want up to the Father often enough, he'll always, always Christ center us back to us, to us. Well, what's your motive, Elizabeth, for wanting a new car? Well, what's your motive, Elizabeth, for wanting your husband to change. Are you wanting your husband to change so you don't have to change? Not wanting to make that sacrifice? We have not because we ask not. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. When I'm praying to ask God to change somebody else, I haven't even taken the time to allow him to do an inventory in me to see if maybe it starts here first, in my heart first. You adulterers. <laughs> oh, he revealed something else to me this morning. I have a lot of people that'll say, oh, you know, I haven't read. Nah, I guess I'm too sleepy when I get up in the morning. No, nah, I don't have enough time. Do you know a lot of people don't read because they can't handle the truth? They get offended when they're called adulterers. They get offended when they say this lifestyle is not godly, that this lifestyle is not, that this way of living, that they get offended when somebody says that you're supposed to give, when you're supposed to give. I, I got another new revelation this morning, An, another brand new revelation about giving this morning. And that little, those two little tables in my heart outside of the most holy place that is meant for sacrifices 
I got a brand new revelation this morning that giving has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with who I'm giving it to. It has to do with my ability to trust God. That's the reason why God says that there's a tithe. So I started in the law with a tithe, just a tenth, just a tenth. It's not because who you give it to needs it, even if it appears that they need it. The giving part is to get us to a place where we trust him in all areas, in all areas. You know, earlier this week, I got a revelation that God measures our, our prosperity by the, uh, the level of giving he sees in us. He's building on each one of these topics for me this week. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. To do the opposite of that causes us torment. It leads us to anxiety. It takes us down the road of worry, into the ditch of worry and stress. They say that God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. When we act contrary to the righteousness that's in us, the result is death inside of us. And he gives grace, generous, as the scriptures say. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. There's, I could just talk for 30 minutes on every line in the book of James. So humble yourselves before God. <gasps> Humble yourselves. Oh my goodness, we're back to the two tables inside of my heart again. <laughs> oh. Wow. So humble yourselves before God. We're at the sacrificial tables one more time. Oh, don't count the cost, Elizabeth. Humble yourself. Humble yourself before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Come close to God, and he will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. What do you spend your time doing? How much are you giving? How much are you serving? Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief, and that's when that sacrifice came to life inside of me that, a, the, that, that back then in the day, the life of an animal. And I, and I was reminded of those animals that I've loved. I've loved the life, the blood has to be shed. Hmm. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. Don't speak of evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. <laughs> Well, I mean, how are you going to understand that scripture right there if you've never read the Old Testament? I mean, I get so tickled at the people that want to come and argue with me about doctrine or theology or this or that and the other thing. And I know that I know that I know they've never picked this book up and even read it. But they want to tell me what's all right and wrong about it. Huh, really? <clears throat> God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Now, he'll step on your toes. When I come to the Father and say, Lord, Lord, will you please talk to Tom about the way he spoke to me? I'm guilty of what I'm reading about right there. Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we're going to have a certain we are, going, we are going to a certain town and will stay there for a year. We will do business there and make a profit. 
How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? There's a proverb that I paraphrase all the time. It says, man plans and God laughs. That's what he's telling us here. You're going you're gonna to go here. You know, I'm working on my 2021 uh, calendar right now. I've been working on it for a while. And then here comes this scripture. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to do, we will live and do this or that. He teaches us down to the nitty gritty of what we're supposed to say and not say. Wow. Otherwise, you're boasting about your own pretentious plans and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. <laughs> And then here we are, Psalms 118. Open the gates. And I saw my heart open wide open to the Lord. Open the gates where the righteous enter, and I will go in and thank the Lord. See, he wants us to go in. He wants us to be so Christ-centered in him, the hope of glory. <laughs> These gates lead to the presence of the Lord these gates lead to the presence of the Lord. A door led from the entry room of one of the inner gateways into a side room, the most holy of holies. These gates lead to the presence of the Lord and the godly enter there. I thank you for answering my prayer and giving the victory. Thank you guys for letting me share this morning. I love you guys.